Hey everybody, Chris Brown here again with another video for Shockwave. I'm fortunate enough to be joined by structural interventional cardiologist at the University of Chicago, Jay Kambati. He's got a great case for us and uh, I'm pretty excited to see it. And I haven't seen it yet, so uh, it's all going to be new to me. Jay, how are you, man? Good, good, Chris. How are you doing? I'm Thanks doing so good. Much. Good to see you. Thanks yeah, for uh, doing this with us. Let's, uh, let's do it. It's great to see you. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, Murmur MD has been such an awesome platform, so I'm excited to be here. Awesome. So, you know, today I want to talk to you guys about, you know, this really interesting case I did in fellowship. Uh, so real shout out to my mentors, Kevin Kroos, Brian Bergmark, Audra Kochar. Uh, you know, uh, we had this case where there was significant challenges in delivering our IVL in the setting of a tortuous calcified LED diagonal bifurcation case. And I kind of want to go through these images just to share some of the things we learned, some of our regrets, so that hopefully we all collectively um, have a game plan for when similar scenarios happen in the future. So uh, we had this 81-year-old gentleman uh, who came to us, heart failure with mid-range ejection fraction, AFib, hypertension, who is coming in with worsening exertional dyspnea, you know, elevated biomarkers and positive stress test. So ultimately what we decided to do is take him to the lab and perform a coronary angiogram. Here you can see that the right system is pretty heavily diseased. And here with the left system, you can see that the prox LED, uh, the mid LED, and this diagonal that subtends a large territory of the lateral wall is heavily diseased as well. A lot of calcium. Impressive amount. Yeah. You can see the arteries without even the angiogram. Absolutely. <laughs> and you have this 100% circumflex CTO that, um, uh, that is here right in the proximal segment. And then we also have this uh, small ramus that's diseased as well. So, you know, we talked to our surgeons, uh, given the presence of this three-vessel disease and this new decrement LVF, the heart failure presentation and what was thought to be a type 2 MI. And, you know, given the patient's age and comorbidities, uh, the cardiac surgeons ultimately turned him down. So we were asked uh, to undertake multivessel PCI. And, you know, for brevity, we initially had this successful IFR guided PCI to the RCA. But what I'd love to focus on today is, is the subsequent stage LED diagonal bifurcation PCI. So, you know, we started up front with a seven French left radial axis, uh, EBU35 guide, and a seven French guideliner. And, you know, uh, probably the best and worst thing that could happen to us is that our first wire kind of sailed really nice and easily into the diag, uh, which uh, was quite challenging um, uh, uh, to get it in there. And we kind of just took whatever we got. And we ended up putting a second wire down. We're able to get that a little bit more easily into the LAD. And we started pre-dilating with the 2.5-NC, and we realized, you know, there's, just as you said, Chris, you know, significant amount of calcium. Uh, so you guys are pragmatic pre-dilation first here. You guys, that's your guys' main first strategy is see if we can get it to relieve. You never know. And, uh, and that balloon did not relieve. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, uh, we wanted to go in with the 2.5 balloon, see what we were dealing with, see if there was still persistent residual constraint, just so we can get our imaging catheters in as well yeah. and formally calculate this IBIS calcium score. And we were surprised that, you know, um, while the LED looked severely calcified, the diagonal itself also was heavily calcified with uh, multiple areas of persistent constraint. So, you know, two vessel here, uh, uh, two vessels with uh, significant um, uh, calcium with unexpandable lesions. And we end up getting our IBIS catheter down. And here you can see IBIS calcium score in the diagonal, at least a Ooh. three. It's a lot of circumferential calcium. All right there too, right at that ostium. Mm -hmm. and here, back in the prox LED, mm -hmm. you can see that that's also severely diseased with the tight MLA. So we have two wires down, which is great. We continue with a further balloon dilatation with the 2.5 NC. And you can see now that when we inject dye, we see this lucency suggestive mm -hmm. of a significant dissection. 
And if we were to look at these vessels up front, you know, maybe we would have kind of said, you know, there's heavy calcium on angiography, a little bit of rotor regret. Should we have just rotor the LED, facilitate access into the diagonal, rotor the mm. diagonal, and go from there? But now with our two wires down and this dissection in the LED, uh, sorry, in the diagonal and potentially and also in the LED, LED. yeah. So, so now we're kind of in a, in a really tough spot. We're committed. Mm -hmm. So in the diagonal, we start using shorter 2.5 NC balloons at really high pressures. Really tough. You still see this persistent constraint. Mm. We attempt to deliver our 2.5 and 3.0 IVLs just to get something down there so that we can modify that plaque. And you know, what was really challenging was this area here, this proximal vessel tortuosity and calcium that really, really um, didn't allow us to, to deliver gear down there. That's really the worst, right? When it's the proximal vessel, maybe you're going to treat it, maybe you're not, doesn't really matter. It's got, maybe it has adequate luminal area, but it's got a bunch of calcium and everything touches that calcium and it just increases the resistance or the friction so much that even if you thought you could deliver the shock wave, because you know you'd opened the lesion up enough to deliver it, it you don't have any pushability because all that proximal resistance it's just it's the bane of our existence right absolutely absolutely this is you know <laughs> this is a kind of a case where you want to sit in a cold dark room afterwards just with all that difficulty and just delivering equipment through that heavily calcified tortuous segment and you know our next thought was gosh, should we uh, inchworm a sem French guideliner down through this region uh, proximally uh, over the two wires? And we still had significant challenges with that. So what we ultimately decided to do was we, would, we took a 5.5 five guideliner and we took it selectively down the diagonal. Uh, we inchwormed it down using a 2.5 non-compliant non balloon it's important people know how you did that, Jay. So you're saying that because the lumen of your guide is big enough, you were able to put a 5.5 five next to the LAD wire, and you were able to selectively inchworm that using non-compliant balloons into the diagonal to deliver your IVL. Is that right? That's exactly right. You totally nailed it. You know, we would go up to four atmospheres through all that prox LED tortuosity until that balloon gently went into the diag, and then we'd kind of jiggle and follow with our 5.5 guideliner, and that actually delivered quite nicely. Mm. We ended up treating all 80 pulses. You know, this is kind of pre-C2+, so we delivered all 80 pulses uh, with our 2.5 IVL in the diagonal. And then we repeated that same process uh, by taking that 5.5 guideliner selectively over the LED wire now, uh, leading with an NC balloon up at four, down, jiggling it forward all the way until we could get our um, IVL to the area of the mid LED here. There we used a 3.0 IVL and we delivered all 80 pulses to that territory. So here you can see that there's good news the, that, uh, you know, we're able to deliver IVLs, we're able to treat the mid LED in the diagonal, and now we're working on pre-dilating <laughs> uh, the prox LED, and and the the war on calcium here continues. So we were thinking of uh, a single kiss mini crush strategy here, uh, and we try to deliver our first stent. We used <laughs> uh, into the diagonal. We used try to use an anchoring balloon here, and you could see Oof. that the Stent, which is so painful. Look at you that know, trying to advance, that it's trying just, to coil on itself. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, just just basically, um, uh, real badness there. So we didn't want to push any harder. So despite using an anchoring balloon in the distal ID, we're still not able to deliver this stent. So again, you know, we use the same technique. Uh, you know, we inchworm that five five guideliner. Uh, back down through uh, the diagonal wire um, uh, over a balloon, and then we were able to unsheath a stent, a 25 by 38 drug looting stent in that area. So here the diagonal stent was implanted. Usually we like to have our crush balloon distally, uh, but as you can see, there's so much issue with deliverability here that we ultimately just deployed that stent in the diag without our crush balloon in advance. 
So for the crush balloon, that was challenging on its own to get down there. We ended up using our 5.5 guideliner again, selectively now over the LED wire. A 1.5 TAC, 2.0 TAC, and 3.0 NC ultimately was used to serially crush that stent. It's wild how hard it is to get back past the stent that's supposedly barely hanging out, right? Yeah. I, I it, it blows my mind every time. Every time I get stuck with something like this where I can't put my crushing balloon distal. And what's funny is when you pull your crushing balloon back, you don't feel a bunch of resistance. It doesn't feel yeah. bad normally. At least I don't, I, maybe for you it does. But when I pull my crushing balloon back, it's like not, you don't even know that the stent was hanging out. But if you try and do it the opposite way, you are just, this is just destined. I guess it's the outer wall bias of the pushing or something. But I can feel this whole thing just makes me feel your pain, man. Yeah, absolutely. No, you're spot on. You know, pulling it back, it feels like everything's going in your favor, but advancing it forward, yeah, whether it's you're you're pushing up against metal uh, with the bias and the outer curvature or whether it's just a lot of friction traversing that proximal vessel, uh, it was it was really challenging. So we're finally able to crush it, you know, and, and now again, we're uh, inchworming our 5.5 guideliner to deliver our um, actual stent into the main vessel from the mid to the prox LED. So we were able to here deliver a 3.0 by 38 millimeter stent. So here you could see that, you know, it was not very simple to rewire this diagonal. We used a Suzuki dual lumen microcatheter, uh, but ultimately our standard workhorse wire just delivered into the distal diagonal. Tell me about that. You, um, is that your, is your preference? My, so different people do different yeah. stuff. Do you use the dual lumen more and keep to the workhorse or do you wire escalate to, you know, a polymer wire more and sort of save the Sasuke for unique cases or how, what's your strategy for this when, when you can't get back across? Absolutely. You know, usually my go-to is first uh, escalating to a polymer jacketed, uh, non-tapered wire like a Pilot 50. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we could uh, also use a microcatheter, which is a nice trick uh, where, you know, when you deliver the polymer jacketed wire, you can kind of dilate open the struts with your microcatheter before you get your undersized balloon in. Like that move, uh, yep. You know, but in this case, uh, we actually tried both of those things and uh, it, it wasn't working out, I think. Uh, just the microcatheter on top of the LED wire through that proximal tortuosity was uh, causing a lot of issues. So what we ended up doing is delivering our Sasuke down and then kind of bringing it back slowly and then and then uh, kind of testing with our well, initially our workhorse wire, uh, which ultimately went to uh, to deliver into the distal diagonal. We ended I love, up I love the Takeru. I mean, you've used them a couple of times here. We should probably tell people about how great they are. I suppose this is they don't give us anything for this, but the the deliverability and the profile of those balloons is just ridiculously good. It's it's such a good balloon. I mean, there's so many times where I'm thinking, you know, uh, gear won't go. What do we do next? I was like, you know, let's just try a really small tack balloon. You know, I, it's 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 really bailed me out of a lot of situations, which uh, which has really been helpful. You know, ultimately we were able to take a one five tack uh, balloon and open up those struts. Um, uh, and then take a 2.0 and a 2.5 NC to ultimately dilate the osteum of that diagonal. Here we started post dilating and doing our kissing balloon inflation with the 3.0 NC in the LED and a 2.5 NC in the diagonal. Ended up potting here with a 3.5 NC balloon. Removed our diagonal wire. Our prox LED was treated with the 4.0 IVL again delivered over the 5.5 guideliner because this area of calcium and tortuosity was extraordinarily painful. And here, again, 5.5 guideliner saves the day one more time with our ability to deliver our 4 by 15 stent in the prox LED, ultimately post-dilated it to 4.5. So much aneurysm. Totally. You get so, switched IVIS catheters, too. Yeah, we switched IVIS catheters. You know, our... Uh, <laughs> rotational IVIS kept giving us issues with um, delivering through that proximal tortuosity despite the guideliner. So, you know, sometimes a phased array having a little bit more stiffness in the body somehow works in your favor. So we ultimately used our SEM French guideliner, inchworm that down in the LED, and we were able to deliver our phased array IVIS. Able to see that 
the stents are reasonably expanded and there's no evidence of edge dissection when we made it all the way down there, which was nice. So this is our final result, you know, um, you know, um, learning from this case. It's pretty good. Do you guys come back for that Ramus later or you just leaving it? We ended up just leaving it, you know, um, uh, he had been seen on follow-up at the six month point and the nine month point. He wasn't having any recurrent heart failure. So we kind of called it a win, but that's, that's definitely a, a very reasonable thought to go ahead and treat that because that does subtend a lot of the lateral wall. Still a great result. I mean, it's a testament to sort of perseverance and diligence. I mean, three lithotripsy balloons. I got to call Kevin Croce and figure out how he affords all these things. <laughs> but, you know, definitely a, a, a dedication to getting it, you know, the best possible result. And I mean, a lot of people would have maybe even given up, honestly, on that once that diagonal starts giving you grief or whatever. But, you know, the it is a huge part of the lateral wall there, especially the low lateral wall and the anterior part. And, you know, you kind of got to do what you got to do to save it. And the end result is fantastic. So, I mean, you can't really argue with that. That's a behemoth of a case, man. Yeah, thanks so much, Chris. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, looking back at it, you know, even just getting some undersized balloons to uh, see all that residual constraint can result in dissection, and it really made me think, gosh, rotational atherectomy up front is often a really, really good idea, even before you put undersized balloons in. Um, But, you know, when you're really unable to remove either wire and bifurcation PCI, in the setting of dissection or some other case, you know, calcium modification with IVL, as we saw here, was was a really nice option. And, you know, when you have trouble delivering with tortuosity and severe calcium, you know, selectively inchworming a 5-5 guideline or really saved the day multiple times throughout this case. Uh, we used some anchoring balloons, you know, just thinking about the area that you're going to injure with anchoring balloons. So shorter balloons are poor anchors and longer balloons are better anchors, but it comes at a cost of injury. So, you know, ultimately, I thought this was a really nice case to highlight that the shockwave, you know, uh, diameter ultimately is about 0.047. And if you have the 5.5 guideliner in your lab at 0.051, it's really nice because it does fit in there and, and then really can help facilitate delivery of this device. It's fantastic. And yeah, that is good to know. I didn't realize that it fit through the 5.5. So it's a nice little uh, trick to have up our sleeves, man. So thanks for showing it to us, and uh, thanks for the case. We appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me, Chris. Appreciate you.